brothers to Yuriko When the grasslands reach to the horizon And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead Back when Rome was a village at Britain the Emerald Island Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead this is our episode 9, and um, I'm sending a shout out to Marwine, as always, again using quite a bit of his material, though not just his material this time around. I'm also using material from another, also Russian site, and that is the um, Oikunena site, um, that I'm using some of their material as well, uh, specifically their Neolithic Revolution lecture material. Basically, we're going to start where we finished off, the collapse of the Ice Age, and uh, the catastrophe that it brought about was it. Because, of course, at the end of the Ice Age, all the megafauna had gone poof. Whether or not it was the help of human beings is being hotly debated by scientists. But I would say it was significant help from the human beings. Because there are places in Europe, for example, and modern territory of Russia, Ukraine, where there's uh, layers of um, horse bones, for example, that are meters and meters deep. Um, so I think that humans have played a significant role in getting rid of certain uh, animal species. Megafauna got, went extinct. The ice has melted, the water levels are starting to rise, and the temperature is going up. You would think that everybody is happy with the temperature going up. Well, as we've talked about before, it's actually completely not a catastrophe for the people living on the planet at that time. Because their familiar landscapes, their familiar climates, the uh, animal species that they have been hunting, their migration routes, a lot of the lands that they were familiar with and that they lived on and were beginning to settle on or at least uh, actively migrate around, those went bye-bye. And so now they had to figure out how to adapt to this new changing climate and to this new environment and how to continue to survive in this really catastrophic end of the world scenario. This particular episode is kind of going to be split up into two sections, um, three actually, because David has a part that he wants to cover. But I'm going to start with a basic coverage of human populations, very rough draft, not very scientific, it's just kind of a bird's eye view of what we have on the planet round about the time of the end of the Ice Age. And I'm not going to call them races because modern races have not yet formed at that time, but certain populations were beginning to establish at that time to where before uh, the nature of human population was fairly mosaic. We have talked about before some of the burials were in one burial, for example, somewhere near Siberia. You might find an individual with various um, racial and uh, just physiological traits that are so vastly different uh, from each other, even though those are individuals that were buried at the same time and obviously lived simultaneously. But right towards the end of the Ice Age is when human populations have started getting established. So what do we have as far as human populations going on on the planet? Our first group that we're going to cover is going to be basically the asteroid group or the group that settled the south part of this world mostly. Again, the Australians were the first group to break off and they're the group that went south. They formed the Australian Aborigines up in Australia where they brought the dogs with them and managed to completely devastate the megafauna because the little dogs, when they arrived on the continent of Australia and uh, became untamed because Australia was full of um, marsupial animals, a lot of which were very large and fairly defenseless. Even the predators there such as Thylacoleo, for example, which was the marsupial predatory saber-toothed lion. Um, they were fairly slow moving and they were fairly available for humans to, har to harvest and eat. And so that wonderful marsupial megafauna that populated Australia for all this time just went poof in a second. And the dingo was born and the dingo was the death, devastation and destruction of the Australian native animal species. So that's one group. Uh, they had traveled there through the semi-continent of Sahu, um, Sahu, which was semi-continent semi because it wasn't really a continent. It was just um, kind of a bunch of little islands and territories connected somewhere separated by water routes. But when the ice age occurred and the ice melted, of course, the sea levels went up and all the individuals and all the different population groups that were dispersed between their origin in Africa and their eventual and goal territory, and that is Australia, got trapped on those little islands and those different areas of land where they where basically the Ice Age caught them and trapped them. This group includes the original population of Philippines, 
uh, the Dravidic population, the pre-Aryan population of India. Those are the people who build your amazing um, Harappa civilization. They have built the whole basically Indus Valley civilization that was extremely advanced and that got conquered by the nomadic Aryans later on. And that eventually merged with and gave rise to today's um, Hindu cultures, culture and the, today's population of some sections of um, Indian population, I guess. Um, it also included uh, very early settlers of Polynesian territories, New Zealand, Tasmania, which is a whole separate uh, tragedy because Tasmanian indigenous population got literally, it was genocide, was straight genocide. Those people got completely wiped out by Europeans when they wound up arriving to those lands. And Ainu, which was the native population of Japan, some of which still survives in Sakhalin today. Now, Ainu is a debated subject because there's a lot of debate on whether or not Ainu were or not technically of that same group. I would think they would be because it would make sense. At least the early waves of migration, I think, would have been related to that same migration wave. They're very unique, very different. And really, I mean, either I know it's completely different and unrelated group, or they fall within the same kind of Australian subfamily of populations. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot, a lot about African um, situation that's going on at this time that we're talking about, which is at the end of the Ice Age, except for a couple of things. I mean, there's no such thing as a single race that populates Africa. African population consists of a mosaic of many different races, many different subgroups and populations, some of which are much more ancient than others, some of which um, are very different from the other ones. And to try to label the entire population of the African continent at that time as one group would be just ridiculous because this is the birthplace of humanity. This is where the most genetic diversity is taking place. This is where some very, the first people come from there. That's really the land of the first humans. And many diverse human groups existed at that time. Now, Africa was extremely affected by the end of the Ice Age because it was the warming of the climate came the drying up of the climate. And this is when deserts started to form uh, on certain areas of the planet, particularly in Africa, separating certain populations from each other. Now, they were already separated by mountain ranges and other natural obstacles, but the desert definitely played a huge role. And we will talk about the role that the desert played when we come to the formation of the Egyptian nation as such. Um, so the main groups, if, if you're going to be able to define the groups in Africa, really, is there's the very um, first people groups, go, and that's the Kaisan family of languages, which some scientists believe is very, very archaic and very, very old, and that's the click languages. And then you have the populations who represent an admixture of back and forth migrations with different other areas of the world. So there was multiple migrations in and out of Africa, of course, throughout the history of the continent. And unfortunately, we have very little information about early history of Africa, simply because A, there's climate, and uh, the kind of climate that is in Africa is not always conducive to preservation of archeological evidence. And second, the European colonization of Africa, which pretty much went out of its way to literally wipe out everything they could get their hands on. So that's unfortunately all I can say right now. And I'm going to research a little bit more and talk more about Africa a little bit more in depth when we get to that uh, continent. Next, what we have is what's called the Europeoid race. And that's basically, and the reason why it's called that is because the scientists who called it that were themselves Europeans. They were very much Europocentric. They were kind of chauvinistic. And so they decided to call anything that remotely looked like them Europeoid. Now that group separates really, I mean, there's multiple separations, but if we look at it overall, there's really three major branches that come out of that group. And of course, this group is the group that had the heaviest that mixture with Neanderthals. We have the Aryan group. The Aryan group is going to be all of our future nomadic groups. It's going to be pretty much, I mean, majority of the world right now speaks um, in the European languages, which are really Indo-Aryan languages and origins. So that's all of your India, all of your Persia, all of your Europe, modern day United States because of the English language, parts of Africa. English language has kind of triumphantly marched all over the planet. So the descendants of this group are going to be all over and the language in particular is going to be the dominant communication language in our today's modern world. But at this time, these people have not yet discovered horse. 
They have, they have, they're barely trying to figure out what a cow is and what you do with a cow. And they're living somewhere, again, hotly debated subject, but most likely somewhere in the rough area of Siberia. And why do we know this? Well, because some of the oldest texts we have from the Aryan peoples, and that's uh, some of the texts we come across in the Vedic texts in India, they talk about an origin, and actually Avesta also, which is the Persian text, the Austrian text. Uh, they talk about not a great flood, but a great snowfall and hiding out in caves from the endless snowfall. And snowfall is an effect that would have taken place as a result of that climate warming as well that creates kind of a perpetual storm um, and those parts of the world. Then we have the Semites who traveled and took over basically your entire Fertile Crescent, um, all of the Eastern territories, uh, Middle East territories, um, the people who hate each other today, unfortunately, the people of Jewish descent and the people of the Arab descent, those are all Semitic tribes, Semitic languages, and they have spread into those Arabian, as it's, it used to be called, not Arabic, but Arabian territories. Um, and then you have, of course, in Europe, Europe, you have the vast and endless spread of the Finno-Ugoric tribes. And this is where Hitler should be very ashamed of himself because you know the Nazi ideal of the blue-eyed, blonde-haired um, Nazi soldier? Well, that is not a true Aryan. A true Aryan looks like a Persian. A true Aryan is dark-haired, he rides on a chariot, you know, he is very adventurous, he has big mustache, you know, big nose, and uh, he is dark, somewhat dark-skinned. Um, the, the really light-skinned, blue-eyed, gray-eyed types is your Finno-Ugoric tribes. And at this time, when we're talking about related tribes, Finno-Ugoric tribes, they populate majority of anything that is northern -ish. And modern-day Scandinavians get a lot of their coloration from the Finno-Ugoric admixture. Of course, uh, Proto-Mongoloids at this point in time are still hanging out in the territory of Altai. They're going to come down pretty soon and they are going to become the largest group on earth. There's more Mongoloids on this planet than anything else. And that's all of your Asia, um, that's your Americas and uh, Siberia and all of those areas. Um, and then we have little separate groups that are kind of enclaves on their own and there are many of those. I'm just gonna list a couple. Inuit is one group that is very um, archaic in their body type and in everything else, some of the oldest people on this planet. Uh, Tibetans, also um, another group. Of course, since that time, now we're talking about Ice Age here. We're not talking about today's population. We're just talking about the Ice Age groups. Uh, but back then, the Tibetan population, because of their isolated nature up in the mountains, uh, they still maintain their very specific and unique type typology. Caucasus, as we have talked before, you have the Caucasian tribes, the original population of Caucasus, which is a very unique, very interesting population with their own unique languages. Um, you have the Proto-Europeans, which nobody really knows what exactly they were at the time, whatever was living all across Europe before the Aryans came rolling in and conquered them all. The so-called um, ma matriarchal peaceful people. I have strong doubt that any people were that peaceful throughout history, but at the very least, these are very little known to us pre in the European population. You have the Picts also in Europe, uh, which is another very unique population. I don't know if they are a part of the uh, Proto-European population or they're their own separate group. Their language is unlike anything else. Their belief system is very archaic and unlike anyone else. Their physical appearance, they were fairly dark skinned, very small, round body type, um, unique peoples, very interesting. And we will talk about the Picts in depth. And then we, of course, have the Sumerians, which nobody knows who they are, where they came from, because they don't fit into any race or group, really. And they obviously arrived from somewhere else uh, to the territories that unfortunately now are ran over by war and conflict. So, um, that's my quick overview, kind of a bird's eye view of what was going on on the planet at the time that we're going to be talking about. And now I'm going to let David jump in because he wants to talk about early chiefdoms. Okay. Um, just as we start these discussions on uh, the development towards civilizations, we're entering the development of the chiefdom, which is one of the two biggest uh, transformations or paradigm shifts in sapiens evolution. Going from basically nomadic hunter and gatherers to settled tribal chiefdoms 
and a lot of things change. Uh, populations grow, they go from uh, a, a big hunting and gathering uh, tribe is maybe a thousand people, 500 to a thousand, whereas agricultural chiefdoms can be as large as 10, 10,000 or more. Um, a chiefdom is, as the name would suggest, the instead of a leader, the way you had among hunters and gatherers, uh, who didn't who wielded more influence than authority, a chieftain has an authority figure. That's one of the the means of decision making was a big part of that. Uh, another thing is you get into social stratification with, with classes. Um, of course, you have your chiefs. Then you have, uh, like in hunting and gatherers, almost all specialization is part-time. Even your shamans tended to be part-time specialists. You start getting craftsmen under chieftains. You start getting, they could be tool makers, potters, uh, boat makers, etc. cetera. Uh, then you get nobles with full-time, with full-time retinues, which are professional warrior class. Uh, you also, at that time, there will be commoners who will also be part-time warriors very often, uh, but you also start getting slavery at that point. Uh, whereas, right, war becomes much more, yeah, war, war happens in hunters and gatherers, but it's more like crime. It's opportunistic murders and, and wife stealing and vengeance raids and that kind of thing. But with chiefdoms, you start getting organized warfare. And with that comes war captives who are for economic slavery. Um, another thing is trade. You, trade starts going... Um, from just materials with hunters and gatherers into manufactured uh, goods made by craftsmen. And that's a real broad, quick overview, but that's a, that's a really big step humanity's taking at that point. Okay, I'm gonna stop now for a second and see if anybody has anything they want to say about, this was just our quick intro run through. Wave your hands at me, you can hear me okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, does anybody and also, when you um, when they settle down, I think you, you now get in the ownership of property and buildings. Yeah, and, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Yeah. Both my parents were attorneys, and they, they uh, taught me the first thing you do when you take over a country, kill all attorneys. <laughs> yes, and telegraphs, bridges, right, train stations, and uh, let's see, post office, television, <laughs> yeah if there's such thing. Anybody else have any comments? Uh, yeah, it was just a, it's kind of a question for David. Um, I never really heard that before um, about uh, not just the stratification that I'm a little bit more familiar with in some ways, but in the older cultures, you uh, basically uh, say that uh, an individual of a tribe, smaller tribe, they wouldn't be like an artisan strictly versus a warrior versus a this or a that. That is what you're saying, right? right. Um, so let's jump into what I'm calling pre-cities or pre-city settlements. And we are going to really be sticking to a very narrow um, area today. And our location is going to be near east, around Syria, Palestine, Israel, Iraq, Anatolia, mostly Anatolia, really. And the chronology is between 10,000 and 7,000 uh, BC, BCE, and that's pre-ceramic, and in some cases pre-agricultural societies. Um, I'm going to talk about the transfer to agriculture right at the end of everything, but right now I want to go over some of the interesting uh, cultures, that interesting phenomenon. Now, all of these um, cities, and I'm just going to call them cities for convenience sake, um, what you need to understand that all of these were different from each other, some of them were correlated to each other, and none of them were cities in any sort of modern sense. Not even they weren't were not even policies in the same way that uh, later on Greek policies would be considered cities. These were large 
clumped settlements that each evolved on their own and according to their own design and according to their own local needs. And originally they evolved quite independently. And um, each one of them was very unique. Of course, there's Jericho, okay? Um, Jericho, um, my dates are gonna be very guesstimated here. I mean, I'm just giving you a very rough, a rough chronology, but the Jericho is about 10 Southern BCE or so, plus or minus. And it's not far from the Jordan, um, from Jordan, from the Dead Sea. And this is the famous uh, settlement that is talked about, of course, in the Bible, was the walls that people blew in a trumpet and the walls came down. What we have in reality is actually a city. Jericho has very thick walls, one each. Jericho has very interesting tower type construction, one each. Can everybody see this? And this is the tower I'm talking about. Now, tower is in quotation marks because it's um, actual purpose for its existence is not entirely decided upon by archaeologists. And it has many little dwellings in it. Now, the tower itself is within the city walls. The walls are quite formidable. Originally, as it was said in biblical legends, and archaeologists thought that they may have served some sort of defensive uh, purposes, but realistically, most likely, these walls were intended to keep out flash floods, more so than any sort of invading armies. This is also the first staircase in human history. So this tower is kind of hollow in inside. It's made out of boulders. There's a staircase that goes to the top. Only so much of it survives, and the top is gone, so nobody really has any idea what it actually was supposed to look like once it's completed and there's a lot of archaeological uh, a lot of debate among archaeologists regarding what this tower is supposed to actually look like the most interesting thing about jericho to me at least is their burial practices which are kind of unique and frankly haunting what we think happened here is that because people started living in rather larger groups than what they were used to before that they had to come up with some some way to deal with this kind of overcrowding situation and so religion occurred Another thing, of course, that happened is you had to deal with the, your dead and to where before hunter-gatherers and semi-nomadic peoples, they could bury their dead as they went along the way in certain locations wherever people died. Um, now you have a settled population and you had to do something with your dead people. So what did they do with their dead? Well, they lived with them. They communicated with them. They had a very close relationship with their dead. Their dead were mostly buried under their dwellings most of the burials were left undisturbed. However, in some cases, some of the graves and the scientists don't know exactly why, um, it was evident that the actual spot where the body was buried and specific location of the head was very meticulously marked. And in some of the burials, the head would be removed and you get a very eerie kind of idea of where you have a whole skeleton with the lower jar attached and no upper skull. What happened to these upper skulls, they got removed they had a clay uh, jaw attached to them. They had shell eyes put in, in place and they were covered in clay and basically made into a likeness or a portrait uh, of the person, or at least an approximate portrait of the person that this used to be. Now there was the original scientist, uh, she, when she discovered these, uh, she argued that this was the first case of a portrait in human history. Others tried to argue with her saying that because they did actual reconstructions on these skulls, the clay masks that were built onto the skulls did not exactly resemble the individual that it would have looked like if you reconstructed the face. But when you're living in a culture when you have no photograph, no television, uh, and you're reconstructing your long since deceased relative from memory, the likelihood of very identical likeness is very questionable. What they did, did with these heads, with these skulls, nobody knows. Only certain people were pulled out, their skulls were pulled out, they were used in some sort of religious rituals, and then they were reburied, usually several at a time, in the same burial pit. So they, maybe it was a situation when you would have a drought and you needed some help, and so you would call on your ancestors or your grandpa and your grandma, or maybe former city leaders, or maybe former religious figures to come out and kind of speak to them, to consult with them. Maybe it was a, um, some sort of a consulting ritual. Um, in modern, well, semi-modern, um, end of 19th, beginning of 20th century cultures, we do have ethnographic accounts of where in times of trouble, for example, only the chieftain of a tribe would have his head or his entire or her entire, well, mostly his entire body placed somewhere on a mountaintop, for example, or on, at a high hill or somewhere else in the village to kind of overlook the valley or to protect the village from the enemies. And actually this tradition is not very unique to the Middle East. Um, 
Does anybody here know why you carry the bride over the doorstep of your house? Anybody? Okay, so this is, this is from Slavic folklore, much, much later, of course. Ideally, what you do is you pick up your bride, you carry her over the doorstep, and you carry her all the way up to the heath, where she puts her hands up against the heath, and then you can set her down. Why do you do this? Well, because traditionally in older societies, you would want to acquire a bride from a tribe that is not your own, right, to avoid incest. So she is a stranger. She is an evil spirit to the spirits that guard your house. Well, who guards your house? Why are you not supposed to hug or kiss on the doorstep of your house to this day in Germanic and Slavic traditions? Because you bury your grandma and your grandpa under the doorstep to your house. Now think about prehistoric house. You don't have windows, right? You don't have a back door. You either have a cave or some sort of a dugout dwelling where there's only one entrance. So your only way for spirits, for enemy ghosts to get into your dwelling would be through the door. And you want to put that honor guard, your deceased ancestors, right there at the doorstep so that they will be watching over your household. Why do you carry the bride over? Because she's an enemy to them. And if you let her walk in, they will attack her. They will kill her. So you carry her to the keys where she can be introduced to the spirit of the house, to the spirit of the clan. And then she becomes a part of the clan if she is accepted by the spirits. And then, of course, now she's a member of your family. She can be put down safely. That's just a little bit of uh, side information. Pretty much about um, Jericho, the biblical account has been disputed and has been disputed and pretty much disproven over and over again. Uh, it seems that the city was quite a bit older than the account describes it to be. I mean, there seems to be quite a bit of other inconsistencies. Um, I don't know. I mean, if I'm going to get super speculative here, and this is just my idea, is that really I think the people who were writing the early Bible might have been working on some older mythology and possibly some ruins they came across and were impressed by because those walls are absolutely impressive. They're incredible. I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has any comments or questions. Everybody's super silent today. I'm not boring you guys today I'm to death, am I? No, I'm uh, struggling to figure out Zoom. I finally got to look at the uh, photographs that you've been trying to share. I couldn't figure it out, but then I couldn't figure out how to get back to other modes, and I'm just... Technology, it makes our lives better, right? Yeah, one step forward, five steps back. Tango, tango all the way. All right, so I'm going to then... Uh, move to, um, and I'm going to have, I don't know why I have a hard time pronouncing this word. No laughing at me. Okay. I've practiced it before and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. Gebe, Gebe, Kela, Gebe, Gebe, Kela, Tepe. Does anybody else know how to pronounce that better than me? Because I don't want to keep embarrassing myself. I, I always call it Goble Teke. Thank you. And that's what happens when you read something in Russian, try to say it in English, and then um, get the two mixed in your head. Say that one more time, pretty please, call me. Uh, I've called it in my head, Goble Teke, and that's what I've heard most people say, but it's, I didn't know if that's what. We're just going to call it Teke, okay, <laughs> for the sake of convenience. Now, this is about 9,000 BC, that's Anatolia. It was discovered fairly recently, I believe in 1994, um, by Claude Schmidt who unfortunately has died fairly young. He was an incredible archeologist who did quite a bit of excavation. Other similar locations that have been found around that area. But the interesting part is that area, that mountainous uh, region, there's really no water source there to sustain any sort of a long time population. And so what you have there is you have hunter gatherers. There's no settlement anywhere near this monument. And this is monumental, and I mean monumental construction. Let me pull that image up for you guys. There's several of these circles. I mean, they're building, yeah, there are multiple of them. So what you have, okay, so you see these columns, uh, the T-shaped columns or whatever you want to call them, stellas. These can be up to 20 tons, okay? And what was originally found on top of this um, kind of a hill that usually uh, grows on a cultural site is you had just the very tips of them showing. And so when they started excavating these, they were absolutely amazed by what they found. So these T stellas, they represent human beings. And what I mean by that is, bottom line is, so what that T shape, it's kind of like a Thor's hammer, right? Each side, what you have is two faces facing opposite directions. And you can tell that that's what it is because on some of those uh, T shapes, they have little hands right in where the column would be. So really, the two square side things, they represent a face. It's a person standing sideways with a hand like this. 
Okay, just remember this two-faced figure. Um, we're going to come back to it, and I'm going to make some brave assumptions about cultural continuity later on in um, classical um, history. Most likely this was, well, not most likely, this was definitely and absolutely by all means a temple. Now there's some debate whether or not the very large sites actually had some sort of coverings. They partially dug into the ground. On the smaller temples, there was definitely some sort of a roof over it, possibly some, you know, tree trunks or whatever put over it. But on the larger monuments, they're not so sure just because the space would have been entirely too big for that early in human history to be able to cover it up with anything. What they think happened is tribes from the surrounding, and this obviously took generations to build. So what they think happened is tribes from the surrounding areas came to the sacred site, and it's a beautiful site. It was an absolutely amazing view even today. And they would work on it off season or whenever they could, and they worked on it for generations. Um, what you have um, on the walls of this construction and what you have on those stellas themselves is you have many, many images of animals. Um, these animals are, varied and they're not the animals you would expect prehistoric people to depict. I mean, there's foxes on there, there are bulls, which is fairly normal. Um, but then you have snake, a lot of snake. Uh, you have a lot of uh, stork. You have a lot of boar that looks like a predatory animal. It's a boar that looks more like a crocodile. It has a very long toothy maw. Uh, you also have scorpions on there. They're all carved in very boxy, very boxy and predatory kind of way. And these animals seem to dominate um, the temple. So the presence of the human exists in two different ways in this particular um, art style, whatever you want to call it, culture. Of course, you have those large human figures. And then there's what you would call the goddess mother. And the goddess mother really is, um, I have a theory about her, and it's my personal theory. But she's depicted giving birth. And she's depicted giving birth, uh, and with there, first of all, there's two lion figures, a lion, leopard, some sort of a predatory um, cat type animal. There's two of them, they are depicted in a very specific style that you're going to see going forth for thousands, and I mean thousands and thousands of years, all the way to more modern cultures such as you know, Assyrian, Babylonian, and so on and so forth, where their tail is uh, stretched out, they're in a very predatory uh, attack pose. and. Uh, they are up on, up on stellas, they're up at the top at the gates. And then on the floor is depicted a female, human female. Oh, and they're boys. They're definitely very much boys, okay? Okay, so on top we have the two um, feline predators, um, some sort of lions or tigers, well, probably not tigers, but leopards. And below it we have a woman who is giving birth. She's obviously in the process of giving birth and she's not a young woman. This is definitely a mother, a mother who has given birth multiple times. Um, and we will see this um, show up in another monument that we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. And she's not giving birth to a human being. She's giving birth to an animal. This is a mother of all. This is not a mother of humankind. This is not your figure of mother goddess as later um, founders of the Vika movement and um, um, the people who want to scream for the peaceful matriarchy in uh, you know, Pali Europe um, would say. This is a mother that is not, she's not a human being. She is, this, now this is my interpretation. Everything up to here was facts. Um, she is the mother of all. She's the wild, dangerous um, goddess or entity. We don't know whether or not she's a goddess, but she's definitely an entity that is the procreative beginning. And oftentimes, as we know from ethnographic studies, as we know from folklore studies, when you have a mother goddess, you, she's also the goddess of death. She takes and sh she births and she consumes. Tiamat is a very far echo of the same kind of concept. Tiamat, of course, is depicted as a kind of a dragon-esque thing. But those kind of goddesses, they gain back to Slavic Germanic cultures, which have maintained a lot of that very early folklore. They are scary entities. These goddesses are not friendly. They're not your protectors. They are the core, they're, they're the source of the wild animals. They give birth to everything natural. These are not your agricultural birth, birthing goddesses. These are wild um, hunter-gatherer birthing goddesses. And here is where I would like to draw one of the two parallels that is my own conclusion, and I've discussed it with Marvine actually last time we were talking. I'm talking about Artemis, the goddess of wild hunting in Greek mythology, in later classical Greek mythology, and Apollo being her kind of counterpart. Uh, both of those gods are not originally Greek. They're not, because Greeks are Ar Aryans, the Indo-Europeans, but those gods, they're imported gods, and there's much debate about where they came from. Now, later on, of course, Artemida is, she's depicted as a very kind of 
beautiful young uh, un unwed female she's a hunter goddess she always has you know her bow and arrow when a young man peeks at her bathing in a somewhere in the forest spring she turns him into a deer and then hunts him down with his own dogs i'm sure you've all heard that legend well early version of artemis um, of, a, of the city of Athes, very archaic, very ancient statue and cult of that particular goddess. This is a bear goddess. Apollo originally was a rock, like literally he was a rock. Um, Artemida was originally a piece of wood, a carved, something carved out of wood, and those are very archaic human cults where you have rock and wood representing wood being the living and the rock being the solid kind of the masculine beginning to where the living wooden female procreative beginning. Um, Artemida in, in that particular cult, it's the oldest one in Greek history. It was the most revered uh, temple of Artemida. She was depicted, first of all, as a female with multiple sets of breasts. She was carved out of very ancient dark wood. And um, it was said that, that the Amazonian warriors that were talked about much later in Greek folklore, that the reason why she had so many breasts on that statue is because they would cut off their breasts so they could better shoot out of the arrow and bow. And they would hang those on the statue. Well, that was later Greek folklore. Um, in reality, that statue always had multiple breasts because she was an imported goddess and she was an imported goddess from Anatolia. And her actual form was that of a she-bear. Her priestesses were called she-bears and there were she-bears roaming the grounds of that temple at the time and throughout almost to the end of the classical period for as long as that temple remained open and standing. And men were not welcome, were not very allowed, they were allowed at their own risk. Um, those bears would roam freely the territory. If the bear happened to eat you, good luck. During their monthly time, the women, the priestesses of that cult uh, would turn into she bears, literally, very much a parallel to the berserker legends of later Nordic cultures. Uh, they were very aggressive, very dangerous. This was not a protector goddess. This was the goddess of wildlife. This was the goddess of wild predators, of all the um, wild prey animals. She loved animals, she hated humans, with one great exception. She was the protector goddess of any pregnant woman. So now this is a goddess who in Greek, later Greek folklore never gave birth herself. But nonetheless, she was the goddess that a lot of Greek women would call upon to aid them in childbirth. Because as the, this is where that mixture of the later Greek mythology and the very early archaic mythology gets mixed in. What later got pretty fine into a almost virginal, not virginal, but unwed, female, young female form, I think that original cult may have been imported from somewhere near the region we're talking about. Yeah, no, somewhere near um, Anatolia because those are, it's definitely an Anatolian imported goddess. And uh, this image that we're about to see, and I am going to show you this image because it is very, very important to what I'm trying to say here. So this is from Chital, Chital Huyuk, and that's a much later settlement. Okay, let me make it available to everyone. I think I figured this thing out. Yay, there she is. This is a statue of the same goddess that is much, much later uh, version of the same goddess. This is from Chital Huyuk. It's much, much later. It's several thousand years later, but you see that this is an image of a woman that is not a young woman. She is not a pretty uh, kind of thin waisted little girl. She has given birth and she has given birth multiple times. She's giving birth in this statue actually. It's a little house statue. And you see the same sort of an idea. So that imagery of the cats, of the male cats that accompany the female um, entity that is representative of birth of all life, not just humans, they also are part of this imagery. This is imagery that I believe is probably, it's potentially possible that it may have something to do with that early um, Greek, pre-Greek even uh, cults in, uh, on, in what will later be incorporated into the Greek, Greek uh, stuff. Um, so, other things that were found um, in the same place, um, you, again, many, many animals, they, there are more animals than there are humans. The human images are huge and the human images are two-headed. And it, another parallel I want to draw is to the Roman god of Janos, uh, you know, the god whose uh, temple um, pretty much remained either open or closed at the times of war or non-war. Um, it's a very archaic uh, Roman deity. Nobody really knows his origin, but it's a deity with the two faces. And there's an, uh, one of the dialogues from classical um, Roman literature where the deity himself is uh, presented to speak. And he says that I have two faces because I stand, stand at the gateway of the worlds of here and there, of war and peace, of reality and non-reality, of uh, divine and human. And I need two faces so I don't have to keep turning one way or the other. 
Now, these are characters, these two-faced characters, you need them a lot through early human folklore, especially Eurasian folklore. And I do believe that that two-faced character may have somehow traveled as a mem, not as a direct inheritance, but as a mem throughout the centuries to get as far as woman in part. That is found also in those locations as something that looks a lot like totem poles, which, which we discussed last time, which is basically a statue that is a conglomeration of various animals and people. And it's topped with a, usually a picture of a little bird, an undefined little bird that looks like a, either a sparrow or a dove or something smallish and non-predatory. There is some speculation that that might represent the human soul. Uh, again, the bird is a representation of the soul of what the dead people is very vast spread. It's wide, vast spread across Siberia. It's in Slavic cultures, it's in Roman culture, you know that sparrows in Rome were considered to be omens of uh, death. And that's why Caligula was so terrified by a little sparrow flying into his window. But there's some, again, this is purely speculative, there's no written system left from these people. Uh, but um, it's possible that that bird topping that thing may have represented some sort, sort of celestial connection. Huyug, which is much later. By this point in time, we have um, kind of agricultural and we already got domestication of animals. Again, this is in Turkey and it is about between 7,000 and 5,000, uh, you know, before, before the birth of Christ or before common era. And so it's a fairly large settlement. But what's interesting about it, even though it was a large settlement, was a population of about 3,000 plus or minus, it is not really a settlement as much as it is a one big house. What it looks like, it looks like a hive. You have these little rooms that are pretty much wall to wall to each other and kind of nestled on top of each other with some larger rooms that are considered to be more of a sacred space, which is where some of the dead were buried or some of the maybe cult, um, you know, traditional cult behaviors were conducted. But people lived in these little rooms and they nestled on top of each other and it all had a protective wall around it. Um, and people would travel to each other's homes. There was no streets, no other, no squares, no, nothing that you would recognize in a modern city. What you had instead was just this literally beehive. What's interesting about this settlement, um, uh, first of all, uh, you were talking about export earlier, David, and this settlement is associated with large stores of obsidian. This is the very end of the Stone Age. The obsidian production, stone tools production has reached its absolute peak. People can do things to stone that nobody of us can even imagine today. I mean, they can decorate it, they can make it perfectly fine. They, this is a region where they had access to a lot of obsidian and it was exported all across pretty much the known world at the time. And scientists believe that the way that it was done, it was you know traded from one culture to the neighboring culture, from the neighboring culture to the next culture, but it made it all the way to outskirts really of anywhere people could travel by foot. Um, again, what I the statue I just the statuette I just showed you, instead of being a monumental statue, now these are little statuettes, and there's many of those found, and they're found inside of houses. Uh, so most likely, instead of being a kind of a big conjoined cult, this was a small um, kind of like Romans did, where you didn't really have so much group temple worship, but you had small domestic chapels almost situations and this figure of this birthing mother was now on the, in the statue I just showed you she's sitting with her arms resting on those jaguar cat-like figures and their tail is supporting her while she's giving birth they're the male counter ego to her female I guess and she's a very important um, figure nobody knows what she represented to those people at that time but I think the cult of Artemides later on in Greece could give us a general idea so the buildings are now rectangular people stop the, uh, building around uh, buildings in this region, people are literally living on each other's heads. You're constantly in your neighbor's faces. And the area outside of the settlement is suddenly seen as very hostile to where before the images of the animals uh, were portrayed as more or less realistic. Suddenly, even though this entire settlement, the walls of it, um, inside, outside walls are covered with reliefs and paintings and decorations of animal images, what you have is you have very monstrous, terrifying sort of animals where you're normal prey animals such as deer are portrayed at the scale to where it's 10 to 1 to the size of a human figure. They have these monstrous tongues, deer for example do, or boars do, or bulls do, where they're licking up the little human figures that are running around with spears. So it seems when people were crowded into these very narrow spaces and kind of isolated from the outside wilderness, to them the wilderness suddenly became a big scary place populated by a lot of monsters. And their knowledge, their previously intimate knowledge of wildlife outside of their urban environment now became more mythologized and more um, 
really stuff of nightmares. I mean, this, the way that the people portray themselves comparing to the animals, you never see that before or again in human culture. It's almost like the pharaohs are portrayed next to their enemies in Egypt. It's the same sort of scale where the pharaoh is like this huge figure and that people are just ETBD things at its feet. So they obviously felt very distrustful, very uncomfortable with wildlife. It's interesting that the hunters are uh, portrayed wearing a leopard skin sort of um, outfits that you later see on Hercules, again in Greece. And I honestly think that that might have also migrated over because the dispersal from Anatolia and the, those regions heavily hit uh, Europe and especially the areas of Europe that were closest to it, which would be Greece, one of the most prime hunt candidates. They also painted uh, kind of a geometric figures um, that kind of look like almost the depiction of a rug or some sort of a floor covering or maybe fabric on the walls, the colorful paintings. They did reliefs, they did them smaller statues. Uh, there was obviously paintings. And one of the best renowned things about that particular location is one of the paintings that they have is um, the uh, painting of the city itself. So it's kind of a view of the settlement from far away, which is the first time you really see humans de depicting their urban dwelling place, like their home city. And there's other such similar settlements, but there was many settlements like that, proto cities popping up here and there. And uh, some of them were interconnected by trade. Some of them were very isolated. They all were struggling to find their own means, their own way of progressing forth with civilization. And it looked like they were about to succeed. It looked like we were about to have those very first cities and the, you know, the birth of civilization as we know it. And then um, another climatic catastrophe happened uh, around 6,200 years uh, before our era. Um, there was a brief cooling period of about you know two to three hundred years that was long enough to cause famine in those regions and what you suddenly see is the cities those centers of clustered people they're getting abandoned and people are starting to basically spread out to the countryside and uh, move away from these sheltered clustered protected very tightly packed groups back into that wilderness that they were avoiding before that's where where they spread to europe they spread to central asia to Caucasus, and they take with them their know-how, their economy, their cultural motifs and legends. They take with them their early agricultural exploration, their domesticated animals. And uh, this is where really agriculture becomes a very, very prevalent and very dominant important aspect of the lives of the people. Because at this point in time, people are starving and uh, the game animals have been more or less exhausted in those areas. And if you want to survive, you need to figure out a way to eat something else. To agriculture, especially I know when I was growing up, it was hailed as one of the greatest progressive movements of human species as a whole. Well, agriculture was actually quite a devastating thing for humans as a such, because as an agricultural society, first of all, uh, hunter-gatherer societies have a lot better nutrition. Today's, well, today, when you have people with their paleo diets, what they're trying to approximate is that healthy, diversified, um, multi vitamin, multi-sources of food, uh, you know, you have a little bit of carbs, you have a little bit of protein, because hunter-gatherers have had a very varied uh, diet, and on average, a hunter-gatherer pre-agricultural was larger physically, taller, healthier bones, lived a longer life, had less disease, had less tooth decay and other problems. With the advent of agriculture, you suddenly get people shrink in size, first and foremost, because now their diet is completely limited to really one staple food, it's either just goats, just grain, just barley, or whatever else they happen to be growing. They are stuck with that source of food and their diet becomes very monotonous. Moreover, to grow this food source, you have to continuously work at it. As a hunter-gatherer, you can go out, hunt for four hours a day, and spend the rest of your day doing whatever the heck you want. Whether it's ritual, it's song and dance, it's sleeping in the sun or in the shade, whatever else you want to do. And now, as agricultural society, you have to toil, toil, Soil and your free time goes away. A lot of the cultural and the kind of creative arts really falls. At this point in time, you see less and less of creativity. People don't have time for that. But people have surplus now. And if you're toiling on the land, and if you have all the surplus, and you see that your neighbors also toiling on the land, and they have surplus, well, screw the toiling on the land. You know, let's go get it from our neighbors, right? And so you start getting real warfare. You, and you start getting real fortifications that are not meant against wild animals, that are not meant against some sort of natural disasters, that are meant to keep out your enemies. And you get people who need to guard. So now you have people who work on the land, which is what David was talking about. You have people who need to protect the people who work on the land. And that's your warrior plus.
And now they're full time spending their entire time on doing nothing but guarding the surplus of the particular population. And that's where your, of course, your uh, aristocracy starts to be pretty much formed. You start getting the separation of classes because people who work on the land, they don't really have time to think about anything else. Reproduction rates grow significantly up. If you hunter gatherer wandering around, you don't want to drag along with you five, six, seven children. You don't want to be giving birth all the time. So in um, hunter-gatherer societies, women tend to breastfeed longer. They tend to have longer time between birth. Just simply, you do not want to be dragging all these kids around. I mean, it's not very convenient to where in agricultural society, the more children you have, the more hands you have to help you on the land. So people start breeding and breeding and breeding and the population keeps growing. And so you get this uh, kind of self-perpetuating cycle process to where the more surplus you have, the more you breed, the more you breed, the more you need to eat, the more you need to eat, the more you need to work, the more you need to work, the more offspring you need to have. And here we are at seven, almost eight billion people today. That was the beginning of the end. Oh, and of course, tooth decay, child mortality, epidemic disease, uh, mice, hamsters, which are, you know, hated animal in the Middle East, cats originated from there. And everything that we know and love about civilization um, started right there. And uh, of course, the very first ideas of some sort of writing is what started originating right about the time when you needed to measure how many bushels of wheat who has turned into the temple and how many goats who has you know sacrificed today to our god and so that's where our first kind of ideas of how writing may have come about and it came about as a bureaucratic pursuit and not at all an artistic one it was a way to count measure and uh, add up taxes really that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover today. That was a lot of material. Anybody has anything else to want to say, comment? Yep, Jake. I couldn't find my little button. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, also, hunter the gatherers were more healthy because number one, they're getting their food fresh right out of the field. Also, they're moving but uh, another thing that a lot of people don't realize is it's more healthy to eat a little bit all day long than it is to sit down and eat a meal and then you have to digest it. And that's why uh, one reason that they were more healthy because they were just eating as they uh, all day long as they went through the fields or uh, gathered the berries or, or whatever. And of course, then if you have food and you settle, then you have to store the food and it loses some of the nutrition and then the possibility of contamination goes up a little bit. You know, and you bring, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. You, you're absolutely dead on, Jake. And the thing is, I mean, the possibility of famine becomes a lot more likely than it does with hunter-gatherers because if you depend on one food source and any climatic change, any sort of a pest, you know, pest or, you know, infestation, any sort of a just failure of grain for whatever reason, um, your entire population, your whole population dependent on that is going to start. The other thing you get is your separation of genders, I mean, sexes at this point in time, because the labor gets divided between males and females um, just for physiological reasons. Physiologically, male and, males and females of humans, uh, even though the sexual dimorphism between the two sexes is not as pronounced as it is in other primate species. Nonetheless, there is still some degree of sexual dimorphism. Males are stronger. They have a different center of balance. Uh, you know, shoulder structure and so on and so forth. There's certain physiological differences between the two. And so females um, wind up doing a lot of the, well, they were doing a lot of the heavy labor to begin with, but they get stuck doing a lot more of the heavy labor. And you get a lot more labor in um, related injuries to where hunter gatherer, you're walking around, you're doing different things, right? You're picking up berries, you're hunting an animal, you're running, you're sitting. You know, if you're sitting there and like all day long, all you're doing is grinding uh, your brain, you know, on a stone grinder, you're going to have arthritis very, very quick. You, 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 you start seeing the violence goes up significantly, interpersonal violence, even within a community, even though religion and organized religions also um, kind of work into this. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I think was the reason why people suddenly turned to gods instead of spirits. But uh, organized religion tried to counterbalance that and kind of create that um, balance, you know, keep down the aggression. Uh, within the society, but interpersonal violence, because when you're face to face with your neighbor 24 seven, and there's nowhere to go away from that neighbor, you can't just pick up and migrate somewhere else to the next mountain. Um, there's going to be a lot more violence and a lot more domestic violence actually shows up right about this time. Uh, David. Just a quick point on um, the Artemis, Diana, 
uh, goddess that you were talking about, that could well go back to like pre-agricultural mother nature. I would encourage anybody to just do prehistoric Venus figures on on Google. It's actually, when we get to early Greeks, it's interesting how many of those Greek gods were really imports from all over the place. Greeks seem to, I mean, all the pagan uh, cultures tend to gather gods wherever they went, but Greeks did crazy things to their gods. I mean, they took the evil, absolutely dark, monstrous god of Apollo, you know, the god of disease, pestilence, striking arrows of plague, and turn him into the god of poetry and sunlight. It's, it, right. I mean, Apollo is one of the scariest characters in the antique world. Greeks did weird things to their gods. What they did to poor Hera is beyond all. It's despicable. I mean, feminists cry in their sleep <laughs> because, yeah, Hera was an entirely different creature before she was turned into this pathetic, jealous creature. That's pretty much it, yeah, unless somebody else has anything else to say. I'm just going to uh, talk about the, the Goble Tepe a bit. Um, it's a very interesting situation that is turning what people know about this time period up on their heads because it, did, it was in the time of hunter-gatherers and it's not a town or a village and yet it's a very, very major installation. Only about 10 or 20 percent of it's even uncovered right now and it's, it's confusing people quite frankly, the archaeologists and whatnot and anthropologists as well, to, to put this much energy into making a place that, and, but the people were not in place, they were moving around. So it's, uh, it's, it's posing a lot more questions than it's answering I think at this point. Yeah, thank you, Colin. And actually, you know, and I kind of shot through all of this. I know we're over time, so I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon. But um, the thing is, I mean, up until that particular monument was, and thank you for pronouncing it correctly, unlike me, uh, before that monument was dis um, discovered, really, people thought that um, what caused people to move together, and they thought that agriculture brought people together. They need to, you know, work together to grow grain or to herd animals or whatever. And that caused them to start actually building architectural, various architectural buildings, I guess, building buildings. And that was kind of the idea that that's what incited the whole idea of construction among humans and that hunter-gatherers really did not engage in such behavior. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. The discovery of that monument had completely overturned that concept because here we have pre-agricultural, pre-ceramic society that is obviously hunter-gatherer, free-roaming, smaller tribes that come together and for some reason toil, toil, and then split up and run away again. And that just goes to show that possibly, it's possible that religion did not originate from agriculture, that you know that the need for constructing monumental things did not originate from living together in close quarters and needing to build kind of a mutual defensive dwelling. But all of that was deeply predated by some sort of belief system that caused people to put forth that much effort into constructing something like that. Can you touch that? Uh, yeah, let me turn off my microphone and my... Just one brief thing there. There was not agriculture, but in in the Fertile Crescent especially, those of Scythian trade, it was, there was extensive gathering of wild grasses that were, would become cereal crops. So there were food sources there that were relatively concentrated. That's all. Sir, we have to time this perfectly so we don't go wow, 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 wow into people's ears. Uh, if you, you know, I, I want to say this. Um, give me five seconds. I need. I want to say the name because I, I will be ashamed of myself if I don't. There was a famous Soviet, early Soviet era. He was studying uh, was studying the genetics of plants. He was working on developing um, of the plant genetics, and he actually traveled to that region. Uh, Thank you for bearing with me for this. I forgot all about agriculture, Soviet. Because, you know, Soviet scientists oftentimes, Vavilov, Nikolai Vavilov, okay, and his uh, dates were 1887 to 1943, so he died in the midst of World War II. He was a brilliant, brilliant cultivator. He was a brilliant, basically, pre genetics geneticist. He did crossbreeding of various um, domesticated plants. He developed many, many breeds of plants and uh, vegetables and um, of everything that is used in agriculture today, not just in the former Soviet uh, region, but also around the world. He was really the pioneer of his um, time, um, Nikolai Vavilov. And he specifically was very curious about the origin of agricultural uh, strains of grains. And um, he traveled and he found specifically several plateaus, not far from the location of those monuments we were just talking about, where the wild versions of those grain uh, cultures that later will become the barley, the wheat, the everything else. He found their wild relatives and he was able to identify the origins of the cultivated plants. 
and I just want to give uh, you know credit where credit is due. That's pretty much I think that's everything I have for today. Okay, if unless somebody else has anything else to say, I am going to say thank you. Um, real quick uh, about uh, the whole uh, transition into um, us uh, cultivating our food versus being a hunter-gatherer. I think that Jake might have had something to say also, but maybe we'll cover that more in the next podcast more than anything. But basically, I was just going to say that it's obviously we haven't had that much time to adapt from, like uh, you mentioned, Julie, our, like, for example, if I go out and I farm cabbages, I'm only putting a certain motion and strain. I'm, it's not like when I go out into the woods and I go out and I gather wild foods. It's uh, it, it takes a toll on the body in a way that we've not really adapted to. It's yeah. mostly what we're going to talk about. Is your microphone off? Oh, can everybody hear me? I'm not echoing. Okay, and actually, again, one last thing. I promise you, the last one this time. Um, they think that that transition from um, basically semi domestic to where people heavily relied what David was saying on a wild, um, certain wild species of plants to harvest them and to where they became dependent on them, where they would return back to the same areas over and over, season after season, to gather up those wild plants and where they started noticing that, hey, if you leave some of the seeds behind, then you, know, you might get a new, you know, better crop the next year. They think the transition from that to full directed intentional agricultural actually planting of those and harvesting of those plants it took it took place within a couple of generations to where the i mean literally to where your great grandmother was still harvesting the wild plants and you you know and your children are already planting your own fields it was a it was almost in historic terms it was almost a blink of an eye it was instantaneous because the because the game animals in those heavily populated areas they were completely wiped out within anything that is remotely manageable travel wise people were used to those regions. Not everybody was ready to migrate. And plus the peoples around the world have increased to such a number to, the, to where, wherever you migrate, there's likely to already be people there. And so finding new lands, I mean, was still possible, but it became increasingly more difficult. And so people started really quick, quickly switching to agriculture, almost by force nature. Um, yeah, it was a desperate means of, for desperate times. Another thing we don't know, the person that grew the cabbages and um, they kept growing cabbages. They, they. I wonder how long it took them to find out about crop rotation and long changing time. the nutrients in the in the soil, because you can burn uh, land out if you grow the same thing all the time. Couple southern years and uh, some parts of Russia, uh, they're using the two-field system to this day. I mean, at least they well, the Soviets put an end to that, but all the way up until the Soviet Revolution and former Soviet Union, there were certain regions of Russia where a two-field system was still being used. Um, none of the early civilization of the what was used to known as the Fertile Crescent, which is now known as the horrific desert that nothing grows in. Yeah. Um, the reason why it's a horrific desert now is partially is because of that. Deforestation, Deforestation plus uh, irrigation systems that got broken, well, first overused and then broken, then you had, of course, the climate variation, but majority of it is really the exhaustion of the soils. Right. So no, people, it took thousands, literally thousands and thousands of years, I mean, into modern times for people to figure that out, unfortunately. Yeah. All right, I think that's everything for today. We are doing Sumerians and, uh, you know, and I want to do the Epic of Gilgamesh in more or less depth because it is the very first, um, and I don't want to do it in the usual sense. I want to do it in a more, it's a very human story and it's very unique and it's the first work of literature that we have. Also, a lot of our biblical information really stems from there. It shows us very well the worldview of two different cultures because you know in the Sumerian what we what is often time thought about is the Sumerian culture is really you have the Sumerian and the Akkadian element and the Sumerians are these guests from somewhere else and there's some theories about where the Sumerians may have come from but they are the very first civilization was writing that we know of they are the very first civilization with literature with uh, such thing as um, parables with such thing as uh, adventure stories. I mean, an adventure novel is something that the Sumerians invented. The, the people who invented um, the two ruler system that, you know, again, persisted all the way to, gosh, I think 13th century uh, in steps of what's today's Ukraine, uh, where you have a priest king and a, and a warrior king. And there's, the, it's basically, it's the, it's the balance of power that we're using today in the United States. Uh, they are the ones who invented a lot, a lot, a lot of different things uh, they invented sex, among other things, for fun. Uh, they invented um, 
gods in a lot of ways, uh, at least the, their gods, and their worldview was so vastly different than the Akkadian worldview when the Akkadians who were Semitic people came in and conquered them and in turn got conquered by them. And even though the Sumerians very quickly vanished from the historical horizon, they left us quite, quite a bit of heritage. And thankfully, a lot of their writing we can read today and read it quite clearly. And their writing system persisted again for thousands of years after they were long since gone. So I think we are done for the day. For the day. So we're probably going to be skipping next. Uh, Brian, yours, I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm, Thanksgiving was last month. It's long gone <laughs> for us in Canada anyway. <laughs> oh, no, um, United States. Is it Thanksgiving next week? Okay, so, so we're probably going to skip next week, and then we are going to um, uh, do the week after then on Thursday, same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. I love having each and every one of you in here. And thank you for all of your contributions. That makes it much more interesting and I think better covering everything. Thank you, Julie. Everybody be well. Okay, see you guys. Bye-bye. that exist within every man's soul every man's and we will soul. live forever or as long as stories are told, stories are told. Stories we are the are told. archetypes that exist within every man's soul